Can dysautonomia cause reactive hypoglycemia? I'm not diabetic at all. POTS started with reactive hypoglycemia, then histamine intolerance, then full-blown POTS. This is, this is probably a good place to step in. So reactive hypoglycemia basically means that we're not having a stable glucose level. Um, if we're not having a stable glucose level without eating, a lot of times we can start to get a drop in glucose levels. And then when you eat, they can come a little bit high. And then we can go through these cycles. And that's, that's the idea. Basic way to think about that is I, in an ideal world, when you get hungry, you should just be hungry. You shouldn't be hangry. Um, when after you eat, you shouldn't have any real change in the way your brain works. You should just kind of keep rocking and rolling. Um, that's typical of this. If it started with reactive hypoglycemia, that may be the problem, but it's, it's not likely to be the problem relative to POTS. It may be a problem relative to what you're experiencing with energy levels. Um, histamine intolerance, does that mean that you don't eat histamine? Does that mean you don't, I don't know what the intolerance side of histamine means, like you don't tolerate your own histamine or um, you can kind of let me know about that and then full blown POTS. So we may be looking at just the sequela of how these control systems are breaking down. If you're seeing multiple organs start to fail in their ability to regulate automatically, then you want to trace back to where do those things all kind of share commonality and then work from there. Um, simple things with, you know, diet can be really helpful with reactive hypoglycemia. And if that's what you're noticing, that's probably the problem to solve first. And then the question would be like how those are related to bots. So you'd have to really kind of start to dive into measuring these things, grabbing the reality of them, and then seeing where they relate. Uh, a lot of people um, have that milieu, but maybe assigning um, like causality to things that may or may not actually be, be causal. Can an EP study help for POTS patients? So an electrophysiologist is gonna go in and measure if there's any errant activity in the heart. Meaning when we send electricity through it, it should be orderly. Sometimes we get blockages in different portions of the nerve or blockages in different parts of the heart where they're not contracting. And sometimes it can skip and like arc to another spot and cause sort of, you know, like fibrillations or arrhythmias. So for someone to be diagnosed with POTS, we kind of have to rule out that they don't have a, a predominant cardiac problem. So we want to rule that out first. A simple EKG is a lot of times a starting place. We'll do a long run EKG. And we just want to see if there's any weird waveforms, especially if you got like a 12 lead Holter on. And you can see if there's weird waveforms and that can prompt further investigation to see if we need to look into um, getting an electrophysiology study. If the EKG is pretty normal, and we're not seeing that, then a lot of times the EP isn't warranted um, because you will usually see some evidence that something is wrong with the electricity through a 12 lead or even a Zio patch, something like that. So uh, if you have like POTS, usually they've ruled out that there's, there's a, a cardiac based problem and now we're coming up into the neurological and hemodynamic system as the, as the point of, of error. Why might acetylcholinesterase inhibitors help with POTS? So let's break down what, it is, what these are for people. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's a, it's a pretty ubiquitous neurotransmitter, meaning it's, it's involved in a lot of processes. So acetylcholinesterase is an enzyme that helps with the, um, the catalyzation of the acetylcholine reaction. So when you inhibit that, you just allow more of that enzyme to be able to process more acetylcholine for a person. So helping with POTS, you, this may may or may not, I don't know the mechanisms I don't, uh, for individual people. I know the results on this are pretty mixed mi and mixed like kind of toward mixed toward not helpful for some people, but some people had great experience with it. So we, we won't discount it. Um, but in people, acetylcholine is, is part of the neurotransmitter profile of peripheral nerves that are autonomic nerves. Um, so preganglionic pre nerves for both sympathetic and parasympathetic, and then for sympathetic nerves, the postganglionic nerve also uses acetylcholine. Um, so by just providing more in the cleft, if you're able to 
increase the efficiency of the acetylcholine, you're gonna get more output per unit of neural firing. And for some people that may have problems with activating, like for example, peripheral arterial receptors may find that they get more contractility in the periphery by doing that. Um, now it's the same, one of the concerns with that would be though, as your body starts to downregulate through the feedback loop and it changes its sensitivity to that. Uh, kind of like the same way people will use nicotine or they'll use uh, other things kind of in a in a like a pulsing format. So it may help, it may not. I don't know if it's a, I wouldn't call that one typically a silver bullet for people, but it can be diagnostic and helping them understand which symptoms they need to activate more and try to and try to improve the feedback coupling of those. Times where POTS can mimic Sjogren's syndrome. A lot of things mimic Sjogren's syndrome because you can have so dry mouth, dry eyes, like decreased um, glandular activity out of the parasympathetic system. Um, but it's not typically gonna it's not typically gonna mimic POTS in the sense that it would rely on like pan when I, when I say pan. So like across systems within the parasympathetic, axes within in the parasympathetic nervous system they don't all work together all at the same time like you can cry and not and not salivate at the same time right so you can keep your eyes wet but also not be like trying to eat at the same time for example um so people talked about those because the thought was like well maybe it decreases some vagal activity and then that allows heart rate to escape and then the heart beats too fast but um number one that would be uh like a kind of a decoupling, like a pan decoupling of the parasympathetic system, but you wouldn't end up so much um, with the pot side of the equation because that would be independent of orthostasis. But what you may see is just a generalized tachycardia and you would see uh, an accumulation of parasympathetic type failure, uh, in which case you'd want to address that. But at the same time, if you, they're kind of hard to diagnose because people that have dry eyes can have dry eyes for multiple reasons. Uh, they can be even peripheral neuropathic reasons, like peripheral neuropathy reasons, changes in just like humidity and temperature. Some people will have eye movement disorders that cause increased blinking, which can make the eyes feel dry as well. And then dry mouth can be caused with um, changes in hydration, sympathetic activity. You'll notice if you're, if you're, Everybody ever know like the cotton mouth sensation, like if you're nervous or your mouth gets real dry. So sometimes um, responses where you have higher attention levels or arousal levels, or you're just feeling stressed out, or you're tired, or you're overwhelmed, which a lot of people are. So if you're just getting blasted on a sensory level all the time, your level of overwhelm is gonna be very notable. So if you're overwhelmed a lot, you're gonna notice your mouth's gonna be dry a lot. And the type of sal saliva that's produced is just different. So in those moments where you're kind of overcooked or your high attention levels, the saliva changes, it's got a little more protein in it. That's the one that tends to have more odor to it than when you're like hungry and gonna eat and you get that like mouth watering type of saliva. So they're just kind of two different things and that's what you're paying attention to. There was a big time frame where Sjogren's syndrome was like, all the rage, so to speak, like all, it was like all of a sudden there was a conference and then, you know, every third patient that came through was like, I, I'm pretty sure I have Sjogren's. My doctor said I have Sjogren's, but when you test it out, it's not likely. And then it improves when you, when you change some factors with brain function. So that that's probably not the case, but some people do have it too. So it's hard. Um, but being able to resolve that on an autoimmune basis is helpful doing things that allow you to be able to, kind of quiet that immune functionality to slow that down can be can be really helpful if that is what you're working with. Um, so you just try, gotta try to isolate that and figure out what's going on. But that's a really good question.